Hi, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Miana. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a access control system, uh, specifically a offline access control system called Smart Air, or as I call it, Broken Air. Um, <laughs> Basically, it will be a case study into the weaknesses of this type of system and how some flaws in the architecture of this system were essentially turned into a skeleton key that can open any lock that's part of this range of products um, and a few other things. Uh, but first off, how did we start looking into this? Um, so, first I'll cover a little bit about what an offline access control system is. To understand that, you probably already know how an online access control system works. There is a controller that the doors talk to, and when you scan your card, some verification is done to that card uh, to get your identity, which is checked against a centralized server, and if it's all good, if you're meant to be able to open that door, the door opens. But that requires all of the doors to be networked in facilities where that's not really feasible or uh, cost effective, then offline access control systems can look quite good value. Uh, what this system works as is the card is the source of truth, essentially. Um, there are encoder systems often as the main entrances to buildings um, which are connected to the database server when you walk in and can sync your permissions and all of that. But each of the individual doors throughout the facility, they just trust what's written on the card, which could cause no problems. Um, so after all of that data is encoded onto the card, yeah, the reader will just trust it, and that is what's used for opening each individual door. A friend of mine was attempting to clone one of these cards uh, for the Smart Air system, and when looking at the data dump, they noticed a repeating data pattern. When you see repeating data patterns like this, they can often stand out because, well, one, it's a pattern, a lot of people are good at picking up patterns, but also it tends to imply that there's no encryption because that should hide a lot of the patterns that would be obvious from just glancing at the data. And also, if you can work out what that pattern means, maybe you can do some interesting things. Um, so, after like that pattern was discovered, had to get hold of one of the locks to mess around with, so lots of hours on eBay. Um, eventually, we managed to find an old reader that had been vandalized. Uh, the case was smashed, but it still read cards, and that's all we needed. Um, we also made around 155 key cards for this system using different access parameters and then started working out what the data on the cards meant, decoding that pattern. Uh, but how did we get all of those data cards and how could we read them? Well, we dumped the data using a tool called the Proxmark 3. A lot of people may have heard of that. It's basically a tool for all sorts of RFID hacking, but I'll cover that in more detail later. As for getting all the key cards we wanted, thank you very much Google indexing. Uh, we googled the name of the software and there was a file share link from the manufacturer which had all of the software, all of the user manuals, even the installation instructions for contractors, so very useful. Um, back onto the Proxmark 3, it's a very powerful RFID research tool. It can read most forms of LF and HF RFID credentials, and it can sniff communications between a card and the reader, um, simulate cards, it can log all the operations that are done against those simulated cards, and all sorts of other operations. Uh, it also has implementations of various attacks that can break encryption on cards. Remember how I mentioned that the card is the source of truth? If you can break through the card's inherent encryption, 
and modify it, that becomes a bigger problem. Uh, the cards that were being used in this system are called MyFair Classic cards. The encryption, if anyone is familiar with that system, is barely encryption anymore. Uh, the way to crack it with the Proxmark is you type in HF for high frequency, MF for MyFair, and then AutoPorn. And around 35 seconds later, you have a dump of all of the credentials for reading and writing to the card. Anyway, uh, once we had dumped these cards, uh, we had credentials that, for instance, opened one door in our fake system with the software we got off Google. And then we had a dump for a credential that opened three doors. And this is that repeating data structure I was talking about. The first card only can open door two. The second card can open door two, three, and four. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> so, yeah, let's say we've got door five over here. It wouldn't open that one. What if we just extrapolate the pattern? <laughs> let's see if that opens the door. Oh, oh, yes, it does. This is what we call a privilege escalation attack. So if you had a card that could only get through one door, now you can get through more doors. Uh, will this pattern continue, though, if we add another row? Interestingly, no. We weren't quite sure why that was, because it seemed like it should keep working. We had other cards that had that second block filled out. So we copied it into the first block, just the doors six, seven, eight, and nine, and it worked. So we must be missing some other part of the pattern. At this point, we found a different sector on the card that was different between doors that opened eight doors versus four doors, for instance. And if we increase this number from one to two, so that it could read two blocks instead of one block's worth of doors. Now it could open all eight doors. <laughs> so the privilege escalation is much easier now, given the door IDs start at one. Uh, we also worked out how to extend the expiration of the cards, the group access, because you could have groups that would open many more doors, uh, change the 2FA pin codes, the cards even told you whether they were encrypted or not. So if you didn't want to worry about their encryption, set the encryption bit to zero. <laughs> um, the cards also store the logging on them, which uh, that's an interesting use case as well for later on. Um, and there are also settings for if you needed to update a system to lock out users who had been invalidated, because there's no, exist, there's no connected system. So if you have a rogue employee, how do you deactivate their credentials? Go and swipe a card on the door and invalidate their user. Definitely not abusable. Um, <laughs> but at this point, and a lot of this work was done by the friend of mine who found this privilege escalation uh, vulnerability, basically. I started getting involved more towards the end and now past this point, because I thought maybe there was more to this uh, very secure system. Uh, right now, you need a valid credential and you can increase its access. I had this really strong gut feeling that you didn't need a valid credential to do that. So onwards we go. Uh, oh, whoopsie. Uh, one thing the software taught us is the cards are configurable. Every system could have a different uh, card set up. Where the data was stored in different areas, you could have different areas for loggings, which are called openings on here. Uh, logging plan, sorry, locking plan was how many sectors were reserved for doors you could open. All of that sort of stuff. That meant that I couldn't assume that every card was the same for every system. At least I didn't think so at first. 
um, and I would need to decode where the lock was trying to read from. So using sniffing tools on the Proxmark, I worked out where the first sector read was. During this step, uh, the Proxmark also could extract the key for the MyFair credential um, by simulating some specific cards and working out um, the key based on some math that goes well above my head but is written into the Proxmark. Um, and at this point we noticed yet another pattern. The last four bytes of the key that was used to read the card happened to be the installation ID for the system, which is what the lock checks to make sure this card is for this system. And the reader just screams that out at you every time you hold a card in front of it. So uh, that, was, that was great. Um, this card also defines the pin code, so you can disable, disable that, make it much easier to use, and um, even to find our own user ID. Um, the next sector that it read is the update on card sector, and that defines how many cards can be read. That's the one where we changed it from one block to two blocks to get eight cards instead of, sorry, eight doors instead of four doors opening. Um, to find this, I just filled in the entire card data structure with a copied update on card sector from a valid card and then just simulated that with the Proxmark and checked where it read. Um, and that tells me where that block needs to go. And the third door, the third sector of the door tries to read will always be invalid at that point, but I don't need it to work. I just need to know where it goes to check if it's a valid door to be opened by this card. So with those three bits of information, I now know all I really need to know about the card structure. Uh, and here's the process automated. So just hold the Proxmark in front of the door a few times. Uh, it takes around six seconds and the door opens, even, even tells you the door ID. Um, that isn't really necessary in this case, but you may as well extract all the data that you can out of the system. Um, with this particular system, like the reader, the vandalized reader that we managed to get um, online, that could only fit around 120 doors. That's a lot for some facilities, but some could be more. Later we discovered that the uh, update on card sector that defined uh, in the user de data, and basically we could define the entire structure of the card on the card. The door didn't care, as long as the very first sector was right. Um, so I ended up being able to completely skip uh, a lot of the simulation work and just construct a door that can now store 840 doors per card. So several orders of magnitude faster for brute forcing a door in a large facility. Um, with the finding the door ID, basically what the lock does, when you scan it, it will search through the update, uh, the locking data on the card, and it will see if you have been marked as being able to open that door, and it will copy your user ID into local storage. Uh, for fun, I made our user ID F001. Um, for all of these cards, so which had the added ban benefit of the logging system if you went and dumped it. If that user didn't exist, which no one had 40, 64,000 users uh, in their facility, it turned out, uh, the logging system would just throw away the user and not display it, because why would you want to see a user that doesn't exist opening your doors? Um, <laughs> But yeah, so once it reads that thing and copies it into the onboard storage on the door, it updates the card and says, cool, 
I've copied it for this door, and then it's much faster opening that door in future. This is actually how we developed an extra fun thing where you could update basically the lockout time and say ignore all access cards created before this time and create a card that updated the lock so it thought that it was at around one minute before the maximum epoch that the door could uh, hold. And then if no key card was created after that date, which only our ones were, it wouldn't let them open the door. So at that point now, our card can open any door, brick the door for all other users, and the only way to reset it is by opening it up and plugging in a flashing tool and reflashing the firmware. So this is a dump using like a little script that I made of one of the skeleton keys we made. The installation ID uh, is listed there and you can see it's the last four digits of the key that's used to read it. Full as our user ID, FFFF means uh, disabled for the pin code and the update on card block uh, is set. Now, we want as much room for those doors as possible, so if we set the door block to be the next sector along, because we can define the structure ourselves, that's how we made it fit as many cards as possible. They also support 4K MyFair credentials, so I've forgotten the math on that one. Uh, you can open many, many doors with one card, more than most buildings will have. Um, and yeah, you basically, once you've filled in those two blocks and specified where it is, you just fill the rest of the lock with 001, 0F, 01. The 0F is the scheduling data. This defines what time period you can open the door. We're going to set that to always. And 01 means the door has not. Uh, read it before, so it will update the door to say let this fool user in that won't show up in logging because you don't want that. <laughs> uh, I was going to have a demo here and show it, but uh, I'm in the middle of an international move and the uh, vandalized reader that's mounted on the side of a cardboard box is in another cardboard box making its way across the ocean right now, so we're going to skip that for now. Um, but yeah, at this point basically all your doors belong to us was the takeaway from this system. Um, a patch from the manufacturer was apparently released. Uh, I never got my hands on the code for that. Uh, you had to pay for a license upgrade to get that update, which was wonderful, uh, at least from what I could gather. Uh, and I'm not paying for a license upgrade for my downloaded off of Google software. Um, so hopefully this flaw has been fixed. But how does this patching work? Because the only way to fix it would be to completely change the encryption on the cards and maybe add signing or something like that so it's actually validatable. The best guess is that you would need to go through and flash all of the readers to allow them to use the old credentials while you do a migration procedure, get everyone onto the new card system, and then go through and flash all of the readers again with new firmware to lock out the old cards. And the whole point of this system is for facilities that do not have enough like they don't have networking capabilities or anything like that or have spread over vast distances. So I am quite worried about this system. The upgrading for this security patch was probably not followed through by many places, especially not if it did actually require payment. That may have just been because I didn't ever really pay for any of their stuff that I couldn't get it without paying. But um, so hopefully this vulnerability has been fixed. The manufacturer was known, was told about it years before this talk or any other information was released about it. 
Um, but it really does showcase the biggest problem with offline access to control systems. If you need to make a large sweeping change, you can't unless you walk around everywhere and plug into all the readers. Um, and I really do hope that at least the case studies of successful installations of this software that are on their website have been patched, because that's still on their website. Um, seen it in airports, power grid infrastructure sites, hotels. So yeah, I really, <laughs> really hope they've updated this. Um, anyway, uh, does anyone have any questions? The lights were a bit blinding, so if anyone does, I can't see for... Oh, someone back there. I wrote all of the code to do it, and then didn't write the documentation and told myself that as soon as you finish the documentation, it will go up on GitHub, and told the co-speaker who did this talk with me the last time I gave it, although it was a shorter version, Oh, it would be done within like four weeks of us giving the talk. That was two years ago? So yes, it will be released very, very soon. TM. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Oh, yes? Um, so the lock for the like the way I showed it in the little graphic, they are two separate units in a lot of the doors where one's on the secure side, so you can't like meddle with the relays and stuff. But for an offline access control system, usually at least this system, it's one lock paired directly with one controller, um, and they came as a combined unit. Um, so. But yes, the, the lock itself is basically just a reader and a, like, solenoid. So uh, the controller is really what we were messing with. Anyone else? Oh, yes? I would hope that the airports we oh sorry I didn't hear the rest of it. Uh, yeah, so I would argue that this system was sold as a secure system and a lot of the places it was used were specifically facilities that needed security because of like as I mentioned, we've seen photos of like power plants, like national infrastructure with these things on it, like airports in, um, in capital cities of like decently um, populated countries and stuff like that. So you really would hope they care about the security, but a lot of the time in these systems, yeah, you just you believe what the manufacturer tells you. Um, and as I'm not a customer of this system, I don't know how much they informed people. And that's one of the reasons why I give the talk instead of just letting them, leaving it to the manufacturer. There was a bit of umming and ahhing on my part going, do I want to release a skeleton key to places that are on like power plants? Maybe not. But also, if no one talks about it, then how are people ever going to find out about this system being insecure? On the case studies page, like, there is colleges on there. I'm pretty sure there's a reference to the Notre Dame and stuff like that. I, I don't know why the Notre Dame has RFID access systems, but... Uh, yeah, so hopefully some people in these facilities sees this talk if the manufacturer hasn't been transparent enough, but hopefully the manufacturer did see this as an oh fuck moment and uh, 
patch it and help people get up to speed because yeah, I really don't want someone walking into a power plant and locking out all the security behind them. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yeah? Did you approach Smart Air? Was it a finding? Uh, yes, yeah, Smart Air was approached and it, like, there was a period where we didn't discuss it at all with anyone while they were working on the patch. I won't say that the process of working with them was particularly fun or unfrustrating, but uh, we did speak to them, yes. <laughs> um, I think that's everyone. Uh, I'm just going to quickly say this is my contact information. If anyone wants to ask me any questions afterwards, that's my deck number, Discord, email. Uh, Anyone's welcome to contact me. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, also, uh, a big thank you to my friend Mixon. Uh, they discovered the original privilege escalation, uh, and that led on to this larger floor um, and development of this exploit. So yeah, thank you to Mixon. Uh, and also thank you to the whole RFID hacking community. Without the people that worked on the Proxmark uh, and broke the encryption on MyFair Classic years ago, uh, the exploit wouldn't have been found. And thank you to the EMF Camp team for this event and all, making all these talks possible. So yeah. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs>